and welcome to the Westminster Institute. I'm Bob Riley, its director, back from a two-month leave of absence when I temporarily rejoined the government, and I'm so happy <clears throat> to be back with you, especially with the speaker we have today. Now, in 1947, George Kennan, under the pseudonym Mr. X, published the famous essay titled The Sources of Soviet Conduct. This helped formulate the policy of containment. Well, the Soviet Union is long gone, but there are still very few people who know how Russia ticks internally and how that affects its external behavior. Paul Goebel is a scholar and writer at the top of that list. He has expertise on Russia, Eurasia, public diplomacy, and international broadcasting. He also served as a visiting scholar at the University of Tartu, Estonia, pr prior to joining the faculty there back in 2004. Uh, he served in various capacities in the government, including the US State Department as a special advisor to the Secretary of State on Soviet nationality and Baltic affairs at the Central Intelligence Agency and at the International Broadcasting Bureau as well as at the Voice of America, where I had the privilege of being his colleague, and also at Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. He writes frequently on ethnic and religious issues and has edited five volumes on ethnicity and religion in the former Soviet space. Trained at Miami University and the University of Chicago, he's been decorated by the governments of Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. To update, George Kennan's essay title, The Sources of Soviet Conduct. Paul will speak today on the sources of Russian conduct. Welcome, Paul Goebel. Thank you, Bob. It's a great pleasure uh, to see you again and to be invited to make a presentation to your group. It was, in fact, 75 years ago this year that George Kennan wrote his long telegram which a year later, as you've mentioned, became the foreign affairs article, The Sources of Soviet Conduct. That essay, or that telegram first, and that essay became the basis for the American understanding of the Soviet Union, the Soviet challenge, and structured what became known as containment, American policy that was directed against the Soviet Union between 1947 and the end in 1991. There are at least, there are many things in that article that are worth remembering, but three I think are particularly important now because so much is being said about containment once again, given Vladimir Putin's aggressive foreign policy and a question about what the United States should do to protect its friends and itself under the circumstances. First of all, Kennan understood and argued in his telegram, which became the article, that the Soviet Union was driven by an inherently false and self-contradictory ideology. And that if the United States and the, its Western allies could contain the Soviet Union, could prevent it from uh, metastasizing into other states, that those contradictions and that falsehood would ultimately breed the downfall of the Soviet system and that we would know that containment had worked when the USSR ceased to exist. That was the basis of what the US did. It was something that was possible because of the relative power positions of the United States and its Western allies compared to the much weaker Soviet Union and because of the particular uh, economic and cultural arrangements that existed in the world in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. The second point that Mr. Kennan made that's important for us to remember is that in opposing the Soviet Union, it was critically important that the United States government and the United States intellectual leadership combined two forces that all too often operate against one another. And that is that the containment policy of the United States needed to have the support of American industry, and it needed to have the support of the American human rights community, 
which was interested in, produce, in promoting democracy. Cannon understood that without the economic power of industry, this policy would not be sustainable, but without the ideological commitment of the human rights community, it would not have the content that was necessary to defeat Soviet Marxism. Fortunately, in Soviet times, the economic community was quite willing to support this position for two reasons. On the one hand, the Soviet Union was a closed economy and it was very difficult for American firms to make money in the USSR. Some tried, a few succeeded, but most realized it was hopeless. And the second thing is that the business community in the United States from the late 40s until the 1980s was constrained by any attempt to get involved inside the Soviet bloc because it could be counted on, it, it, the, the human rights community could be counted on to denounce them as soft on communism if they did. And as a result, there was very, very little uh, economic involvement by the American companies in the USSR. That kept that alliance together and it was one that Kennan understood from the beginning was essential to winning the Cold War. The third, uh, the third uh, thing that, that uh, Ambassador Kennan understood is something that is often forgotten. The Soviet agenda driven by this ideology was, was to spread communist systems and Soviet control of them across the world, country by country. What that meant was that the Soviet ideological agenda was in many ways a very traditional foreign policy effort of aggrandizement. Moscow wanted to control Poland, so it wanted Poland to have a communist government which would allow Moscow to control it. It wanted to control East Germany, same thing. That was a kind of challenge to Western powers like the United States and Great Britain and France that was something we knew how to respond to. Keeping an aggressive uh, power bound up, limited in its activities of expanding its power over other states, entire governments, was something we had experienced with before because that's how foreign policy was played in the 19th century. And it was certainly how we had seen Hitler behave with respect uh, to the Third Reich uh, just a, a few years earlier. So what Kennan said is this allows, this means that the United States has to, in the first instance, form military alliances to buck up those countries threatened by uh, Soviet expansionism, that it needs to provide assistance to those countries' governments to take care of those social classes, usually the poor, uh, that the Soviets might exploit against uh, those governments. And at the same time, the United States needed to have a policy uh, of income redistribution at home that would ensure that there was never an underclass that the Soviets would have any chance of getting recruits from. Yes, it's true. There were an awful lot of Soviet agents penetrating the American government at the time of Franklin Roosevelt. But it's also true that those numbers were microscopically small compared to the American population. And what Kennan understood is that as long as they remained small, they could be dealt with as criminal activities that we had means to address. They must never be allowed to grow. And therefore, there was a certain discipline imposed upon ourselves uh, in coping uh, with the Soviet Union. 45 years later, the importance of these three insights, and of course, many more things that Kennan offered over the years, meant that the USSR self-destructed. It, it simply ceased to exist. This was an amazing thing. It was so amazing, people didn't quite know how to respond to it. Um, the United States, it's sometimes forgotten, was so uncertain what would happen if the Soviet Union dis finally disappeared uh, that it kept the Soviet flag up in the US Department of State a week after it was taken down over the Kremlin and over the Russian embassy, which is hardly a sign of great insight and planning, 
of the kind that's often claimed by participants in the administration at the time. There was the tasks that we face in the Cold War were remarkably sim simple, as I've suggested. They were traditional, as Kennan understood. They simply required that the discipline be maintained for a very long time. That discipline was possible because of the Soviet government's commitment to communism, which provided a kind of focus, an enemy that the United States could deal with. When Gorbachev came to Washington for the first time, he brought along with him Georgi Arbatov, the Soviet Union's leading expert on American political affairs. And Arbatov made a remarkable comment, which I've never forgotten, because I think it says a lot about the way this country functions. Arbatov said that Gorbachev was going to do something far more terrible to the United States than any Soviet, earlier Soviet leader had. Namely, he was going to take away the enemy of the United States. And without an enemy, he was not sure the United States would be able to function. Because having an enemy, as the Soviet Union clearly was and was understood to be, provided a discipline of American politics and a focus of American political activity, which without, a dis without such an enemy, uh, the United States in, in rapidly lost its way. Indeed, as evidence of that, it's difficult to imagine any other country on earth where Francis Fukuyama's book, The End of History, could have become a bestseller. The idea that history could be over because of one singular event, and that was a celebration of American democracy and American uh, capitalism, free market capitalism, uh, was all very well, but it was so ahistorical as to be unbelievable, except by the American political elite of the 1990s, which desperately wanted to proclaim victory, pocket the benefits of that victory, and ignore foreign policy for a decade. And in the 1990s, that's exactly what happened. The United States ignored what was happening around the world. It ignored what was happening in Russia. It celebrated its own achievement, and it acted as if that was inevitable and that we would never have a problem again. Our ignoring problems in many parts of the world led to deterioration. It's difficult to imagine that either the crisis in Rwanda, leading to the death of 800,000 people, or the vicious civil wars in the former Yugoslavia would have happened had the United States not decided to look away. We were only pulled back into world affairs when we were attacked by what was the candidate for the next new enemy, namely Islamic, Islamist radicalism in 2001. And more recently, some have suggested that China represents the kind of challenge that will reimpose discipline on the United States and that will force us to organize ourselves so that we can be in a position to uh, defend our national interest and to promote them around the world and not see ourselves go under to a new rising power. There's a lot one could say about what happened around the world between 1991 and 2001. Most of it isn't all that positive to remember, but what is especially not positive to remember is the way in which the United States looked away from the Russian Federation, adopted a policy of weak neglect rather than tough love, and therefore saw something emerge in Russia, which is far more threatening to the United States, far more dangerous to what the United States stands for, a far greater challenge than anything we face from the Soviets, and one that is going to be far more difficult for us to counter. We simply didn't pay attention to what was going on. We were unwilling to take the steps of providing assistance to the Russian peoples so that they would be able to get through what was a difficult transition. And not surprisingly, they began to blame us and the transition from communism uh, as something we wanted to hurt them. Not surprisingly, politicians rose up, including Vladimir Putin, who promised to take revenge. And that's what we're seeing. 
We also ignored throughout the 1990s, having proclaimed Russia a democracy in 1991. It wasn't a democracy then, it's not a democracy now, but we proclaimed it a, a democracy and we assumed that everything would work out as long as they got privatization right. This sort of pseudo Marxist economic determinism had the effect of leading us to ignore the collapse of any progress toward a rule of law, something Russia did not have and does not have, that leading to a situation in which there was more income differentiation with the richest Russians now being among the richest people in the world, while most Russians are vastly poorer than even sub-Saharan African countries. We ignored that and we failed to see what that would mean as a political motivation for launching a new crusade against the United States and against, against Western democracy, and indeed even against what we understand as free market capitalism. And the third thing that happened in the 1990s, which is perhaps the most important and certainly the easiest to understand, although it was a horrific mistake that we weren't paying attention. The way in which the Yeltsin regime handled the privatization of the Soviet state, the Soviet economy, resulted in the creation of a class of oligarchs of exceedingly wealthy people who in the course of that decade and the following one, transferred out of Russia more than 1.5 trillion, with a T, trillion dollars. The Soviets had never had that kind of economic presence in the, in, in the West by three or four orders of magnitude. They had never had that kind of money to throw around, to buy up people, to corrupt other societies, to exploit uh, various possibilities to promote Russian policy. I mean, corrupting an entire country is a rounding error if you have $1.5 trillion that's floating about largely uncontrolled, especially because you can be sure that those Western institutions, banks, corporations, and governments that are benefiting from that money flowing through their, their coffers are going to be interested in making sure that that money continues to flow rather than opposing it. And that is something that perhaps is at the basis of what has changed in the relationship between Moscow and the West with the rise of Vladimir Putin. Putin came to power, of course, not as a fully formed revanchist and fascist, I would argue, politician, but rather as somebody committed to providing some kind of stability in a country that had been profoundly uh, ratcheted around by the collapse of communism, by the failure of Russia to have an economy that produced anything anyone wanted. The only thing anyone wanted to buy from Russia or indeed even wants to buy from Russia now, are raw materials that Russia hasn't processed, oil, gas, rare earth minerals, and the like. So what happened is the Russian people sank further and further down, and Putin, to cover that and to protect his wealthy friends and his own personal wealth, and he's certainly one of the wealthiest uh, people on the planet, beginning in, in 2008, at his speech at the Munich Security Conference, he warned that Russia was coming back, that it would use all the tools at its disposal to prevent other people from abusing Russia further, and that it would use those tools as well to destabilize, divide, and confuse Western democracies so that they could not pose a threat to Russia, as he understands it. That attack in 2008 was at the time dismissed by most Western governments as for a domestic audience. That he was speaking to Russians who had suffered a great deal in the previous 20 years, and he was giving them some kind of, of, of sense that the government was going to look after them and the interest of Russia as a country. Those people were wrong. What this was, was a roadmap for a revanchist state that was going to be attacking other countries in its neighborhood and seeking to undermine Western democracies 
including our own. It began by attacking Georgia, invading Georgia in 2008. In 2014, uh, Mr. Putin invaded and then illegally annexed Ukraine's Crimea. He's put his armies into Africa, his money into any opponent he can find to the United States, and he has used Western technologies against themselves. Unfortunately, as Vladimir Putin was doing that, many American strategic thinkers were going right back to George Kennan's article on the sources of Soviet conduct. And therefore, they were fighting the last war, as old generals often do. But because the, Russia, the, Russia, the sources of Russian conduct now are not identical to the sources of Soviet conduct in 1946, it's critically important that we understand the difference, that we can see that what is happening now, what Mr. Putin is doing, reflects an entirely different set of sources of conduct. And I, what I would like to devote my remarks today primarily is to examining the key elements of those sources. They are, as I say, fundamentally different from the Soviet Union. And they are going to prove much harder for the United States to counter, not just because Moscow has resources in the form of money that it never had before, but because it is not in an ideological straitjacket that the Soviet government often was because of its belief in communism. Former Estonian president Thomas Hendrik Ilvas once remarked that if the Russians ever came back to Estonia, they would not be constrained by communism. That's a very useful place to begin because in many ways, the constraints that the Soviet governments operated on, there were things it didn't do. No Soviet, no Soviet government attempted to recruit rich people. No Soviet government attempted to work through the banking system. No Soviet government had the opportunity to make use of social, social media. They didn't even exist. Putin is prepared to do all those things because his agenda is not to spread Soviet control country by country or Moscow's control country by country in the name of an ideological vision of the transformation of the world. And because it isn't, he's willing, able, and quite frankly, all too ready to do things that don't make sense, that don't seem to be consistent and because they don't seem to be consistent, they're often ignored. That's what's happened in the last decade. And it's terribly important that we get beyond this obsession with either assuming that Russia is a liberal democratic free market ally of the United States once and forever, as the readers of Francis Fukuyama's book would have believed, or that it is simply a remake of the Soviet Union that it is driven by the same ideological concerns and seeks the same kinds of advantages. What Russia wants now is not what the Soviet Union wanted. What it is prepared to do to get what it wants is very different than what uh, the Soviet Union was prepared to do. And the resources that Moscow has to achieve those ends are different and in many ways far larger than anything Stalin Khrushchev or Brezhnev could ever have dreamed of. So now I would like to divide the rest of my remarks into two parts. In the first, I'd like to talk about how Russia is not the USSR, because it is important to understand that Russia today is not the Soviet Union and isn't going to be the Soviet Union again. The people who came to power in 1991 and 2001 don't want to go back to the Soviet Union. They might want to go back to a time when the West feared Moscow the way it feared uh, Moscow in Soviet times, but they're not interested in going back to that system because that system precluded would preclude them, <coughs> excuse me, from uh, gaining the wealth and influence and access to the goods of the West 
that they are not prepared to give up. That's critical to understand. The second thing I want to talk about is, is, a sec, uh, is and related to that, are to specify a little more clearly exactly what Moscow's goals are, what resources it has, and what tactics it can and has been using. Each of those is important if we're going to address the final point in my remarks today. What do we do about it? So often when I've done congressional testimony, I've described problems. And the first question I always get from one or another congressman or senator is, well, you've told us what the problems are. Now what's the solution? I wish I could tell you the solution was easy, quick, simple, and that we're likely to do it. Unfortunately, it won't be easy. It certainly will not be quick. And the likelihood that we as a society are going to come together in ways that will allow us to achieve the great successes we had by those who followed Kennan's advice dealing with Soviet conduct are much less likely to be available in our attempts to cope with Russian conduct now. But what I want to talk about first then is on how Russia is not the Soviet Union. First, it's much smaller. The population is less than half as big. It's economically less important. The Soviet Union, for all of its problems, had an economy that actually produced things that it was able to sell abroad or uh, to people who often had few choices to turn it down, namely the Soviet bloc. Today, the only thing the, the Russian Federation exports is oil and gas and other natural resources. The country is fundamentally weaker in all of the strategic ways we measure these things. In 1990, there were 5 million men in the Soviet military. Today, there are 800,000 in the Russian military. That's simply not all that big. In fact, uh, Turkey, which has the second largest standing army in the West is within spitting distance of having an army as large as the army of the Russian Federation. To be sure, Russia still has nuclear weapons, although it is far from clear how many of them actually work uh, given the decaying situation in Soviet nuclear technology and research. The biggest change, however, is that the Soviet Union had real allies. Not all of them willing, but some were very willing. It built up allies because it was able to organize people against the United States, against the Europeans, anti-colonial movements. The Third World Movement was a Soviet creation. It was directed against the West. Right now, Russia has no allies. Even Russian commentators routinely say that the only country that might be an ally of the Russian Federation is Turkmenistan, which is hardly going to allow Moscow to stand up against anybody. Uh, the countries that vote with it at the UN are equally outcast as, as the Russian Federation has become since its violations of the law, uh, international law with regard to the uh, uh, absorption of Crimea. Uh, with its use of chemical weapons to attack its own dissidents and emigres. Uh, and so uh, it doesn't have the kind of alliance structure on which a great power has to rely in a complicated world like ours. It is also not governed by communists. The people who believed in Marxism, Leninism, uh, probably were killed off by Stalin but even under Brezhnev, there were people who believed in the Marxist idea of progress in the notion that this was socialist, state socialism was the wave of the future and they wanted to promote it. Vladimir Putin and the generation of secret policemen who've taken over the Russian Federation have no such commitment to those ideas. They are absolutely indifferent to social inequality. As far as they're concerned, the wealthy can get wealthier and the poor, ever poor, 
And if they die out, uh, that's just okay too, if we don't need their labor power. The Russian government under Vladimir Putin has continued to spend more on the military at a time when during the pandemic, Russia has closed, closed, continued to close thousands of hospitals, which has led to more deaths from the coronavirus in Russia than were any that were necessary at all. This kind of thing just is a very different attitude. It is a kind of extremist Ayn Rand, selfish capitalism, unconstrained by any morality other than power. And that's a very different kind of political leadership than anything we ever saw in Soviet times. The Soviet argument with the West was in fact an argument within the West. It was an argument between those who believed in the primacy of the state as opposed to those who believed in the primacy of society. But it was not an attack on state and society at the same time. I would argue that the, so that the Russian Federation today is better understood as a massive corporation run for the benefit of its owners, namely the people at the top in the Kremlin, rather than as a state designed to function to benefit its population. Uh, the numbers are, are conclusive. And that, is, that leads, to a, leads to a very, very different kind of approach to foreign and domestic policy. The agenda that, these, that this government has, the Russian government has, is not then to retake territory, to take control of governments that become slavishly obedient to Moscow. At least that's not the case beyond the borders of the former Soviet space, or at most, the borders of the former Soviet bloc. Moscow simply isn't trying to do that because it can't. Its own approach to things doesn't allow it to build the kind of social and political base foundation that might make that possible. Instead, what the Russian government under Vladimir Putin is interested in doing is destabilizing other countries and their leadership of the West in particular, so that, it's not in a, that they are not in a position to focus on what Russia is doing, to unite and act in concert against what Russia is doing, but instead are forced to focus on their own internal problems so that Russia can do what it wants in its neighborhood. And anyone who challenges it can be uh, isolated through the use of social media and corruption. And if those things don't work, uh, it's quite prepared to use, as we've seen, um, weapons of mass destruction, namely poisons of various kinds uh, injected into the veins of people that Vladimir Putin doesn't like. To cover all this and to make it more uh, uh, popular within Russia, Vladimir Putin and his leadership have promoted a revanchist foreign policy of making Russia great again. They have, pr they have promoted a radical nationalist agenda where ethnic Russians are superior to everyone else in a country which is going from being approximately one-fifth non-Russian in 1991 after the USSR came apart to a country which at present is certainly more than one quarter and indeed almost a third non-Russian, a situation which is explosive, but which amazingly the West has, has largely ignored. I want to come back to that. But if Russia is suffering from a lot of losses in terms of its ability to promote its policies, it has also gained a number of advantages uh, compared to the Soviet Union. The first and probably the greatest is that most people, large numbers of people in the United States and most people in the West don't want to see Russia as an enemy. They want to see Russia as a part, potential partner that may have gone astray on this or that issue rather than the kind of existential threat that they were almost all prepared to see the Soviet Union. What that means is that whatever Moscow does, there will be those in the West and in Western governments who will argue that what it is doing is not a threat, that it's being misunderstood, 
that it should be that we should make it take steps to uh, uh, to find a, a reset, to find new bases for cooperation, because after all, they're capitalists, and if their democracy doesn't look exactly like ours, well, democracies vary, and again and again, there's been a co almost complete unwillingness in the West to see the threats that the Russian Federation poses, even when people talk about uh, Russian use of the internet and social media against Western democracies, including our own. There has been a reluctance to see that as part of a larger strategy directed against the destabilization and weakness, weakening of the West so that it can be brought down to Russia's level and Russia can get away with what it's been doing. They, they are the second great advantage. And I've mentioned this before, but it needs to be stressed again and again because people forget it. In Soviet times, people in, the, in Western countries or third world countries who signed up to work with the Soviet Union did so almost exclusively for ideological reasons. The Soviet government was notorious in not paying its spies very much. People who spied for Moscow in the 40s, 50s, and 60s did so because they foolishly believed in communism. Now, Russia has enormous amounts of money and is prepared to buy people and governments and institutions because it can. When you have 1.5 trillion, trillion US dollars floating about in Western banks, that by itself has an influence. But it means that a tiny portion of that, if siphoned off, and that's easy enough for governments and intelligence agencies to do, a tiny fraction of that can create enormous problems and offer the opportunity to recruit people, either by offering them trips, by offering them employment as in, in, in Russian corporations, as they did to former German Chancellor Gerhard Schroeder, uh, by providing financial assistance to businessmen who may be in trouble uh, in their own societies. These are things that the Soviets could never do because they didn't have the money. And if they had had the money, those were things that their ideology would have prevented them from thinking about doing because it would be counter, it would be anti-Marxist, anti-Leninist to fund rich people in order to pursue your own goals. Only people who would come over on their own from among the rich, uh, people like Alger Hiss, for example, uh, were acceptable. But to buy those people, that was not something any self-respecting Soviet communist could consider. And they were the, the Russian government also did something that the Soviet government generally did not. In Soviet times, the Soviets saw Western institutions as the enemy. They saw them as something to be taken down as such. The Russian government, on the other hand, sees Russian ins or Western institutions as providing opportunities in which those same institutions, which are at the core of Western society, eco economy and society, to turn them against in martial arts fashion. And Putin, of course, is famous as a martial artist, uh, martial arts enthusiast, by turning the strengths of his opponents against the against them uh, by exploiting the inherent weaknesses of these institutions. And Putin has done that again and again, and we, we as we all all know. Now. To put to clear, to be very clear, the Russian, the sources of Russian conduct are about goals, they're about resources, and they're about tactics. The goals are so are so different from the Soviet goals that it is difficult to uh, to imagine. The, what Moscow wants today is not what Moscow wanted in 1946 and trying to stop it with the same tactics that were used in 1946, while it may be attractive, uh, is not very clever. It will ensure that we will be building Maginot lines and the 
dictator, the new dictator, will be running around them, just as Hitler did uh, in 1940 in France. The Russian Federation is a declining power. It is a country that is going to be weaker and weaker, that's going to have a smaller and smaller population. This year, it lost 500,000 additional people, deaths, uh, excess deaths over births. Uh, about, uh, about half of that maybe can be ascribed to the pandemic, although not all of those, even that half, were victims of the coronavirus, but rather the collapse of the Russian medical system, which couldn't cope in many places with the pandemic. Uh, it, is, it, is, it simply doesn't have enough people to be able to draft a, a, a large military. It doesn't have an attractive ideology. I don't know anyone in the West who's signing up to be a foot soldier for the Russian world the way there were lots of people in Soviet times who were prepared to sign up to be foot soldiers for the communist future. And that means it has to adopt a different policy. The first and foremost goal, the, the basic structure, basic impulse behind Putinism is to bring everyone else down to his level by spreading destabilization and disinformation. That is the basis of his efforts to destabilize democracies by promoting radicalism on the far right as well as the far left. The Soviets would have welcomed promotion of radicalism on the far left, seeing such people as the natural allies of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. But Vladimir Putin is quite prepared to get in bed with Nazis and with the far right of other, other kinds because anything that undermines, that corrodes democratic structures is from his point of view, valuable. That is a big change. And unless we recognize that that's where he's coming from, we're not going to get it right. He is also committed as part of his own contempt for the people and for democratic values to undermine the principle of truth on which democracies rely. Democratic governance is only possible if people can have some confidence that they share the same facts, even if they don't share the same opinions. What Vladimir Putin has promoted, and he's had lots of willing accomplices in this, is the idea that there is no such thing as a fact. There are only opinions. And therefore, one person's opinion is as valuable as any. And therefore, any fact is as likely to be true as untrue as any other fact. That's led to a post-truth world, which has meant democracies across the West have been destabilized, not just our own. And third, he has tried by promoting a combination of uh, smiles and frowns to keep the West off balance. Whenever it appears that the West may be wake, waking up to the fact that Putin's regime represents an existential threat to themselves, albeit a very different existential threat than the Soviets presented in 1946, he'll do something that somebody likes. And then people will say, well, all this should be forgiven. We should ignore anything bad that he did. And that is going to be accepted for the worst of all possible reasons, namely that the business community in the West, which in the past could be counted on to stand up against communism, either because there were no real possibilities of making money there or because they didn't want to be charged with being soft on communism, will be only too happy to jump in and they will have an impact, an important impact on the governments of the countries of which they are citizens. We've seen that again and again and again. The resources, the second part, the resources that are part of this new Moscow agenda, first and foremost, of course, is money. I've talked about that. But I think we need to understand that it's not just money. It is that the level and intensity of contacts between 
Russia and the West has expanded geometrically under Putin. There are far more people going back and forth. There are far more friendships and linkages. And these things are all being used to stop those, stop efforts to promote an understanding that Russia does represent an existential threat. I know many Russians who have come to this country uh, vastly more than ever came in Soviet times. And the numbers in Europe are even greater. What they are doing is not necessarily that they are self-conscious agents, but their presence creates a different situation. One in which Westerners begin to depend on them. They invest in the local economy. They offer uh, trips to uh, various places in the Russian Federation. And that means that they have an influence. Uh, shortly before I came, uh, recorded this, this talk, I got an email from someone who said, I've just been offered a free trip to a, a Russian city if I'm willing to do a review of this, this one rather obnoxious Russian figure. And the person said, I think I'll take it. Well, when you get to that point, you can imagine the kind of networks that are out there. And those, those, uh, that kind of arrangement has allowed Moscow to exploit things like social media, like the internet, in ways that are very difficult for people to track down. This all leads to the, uh, the fact that Putin, unlike the Soviet leaders, doesn't operate under the constraints that they did. He's not a prisoner of ideology. He's driven by naked self-interest. And because he is, some people say, well, that's what everybody does. Well, no, everybody doesn't do that. When we live in complex societies, we have to find ways to live together and to cooperate and to have rules and rule of law. Putin doesn't believe in that. His behavior toward Alexei Navalny and others shows that he has nothing but contempt for law. What he's doing is engaging in a brutal, brutal dictatorship and he's willing to ignore laws and rules of the game at all levels, nationally and internationally. It's going, to be, it's going to be a situation that's going to be very, very difficult for people in, in the West to counter. We've already seen how difficult it is to uh, deal with Russian penetration of our social media and our political system. We've already seen how difficult it is to uh, control black Russian financial flows through Western banks and American banks especially because the Western banks are only too pleased to have this money because having the money allows them to make a big profit. And they're not interested in giving that up. They don't see that what they're doing has negative consequences for their country because there is no explanation being given uh, by the government or by uh, the intelligentsia to explain that if you're involved in this kind of thing, you are promoting the kinds of negative consequences for the United States and the American system and democracy and free market capitalism more generally uh, that should never be allowed. Are we going to be able to respond? Well, I think we can. And I think in thinking about that, we, <clears throat> we need to take something from the, contain the lessons of containment uh, the principles offered by George Kennan 75 years ago. I think we also need to take uh, some lessons from those like the Dulleses in the 1950s who called for a much, and Ronald Reagan later, who called for a much more forward approach of coping with communism and uh, an approach which often was referred to as rollback of trying to drive that system out of existence by challenging it directly. And third, I think that, and this is the most important, I think we need to change ourselves. The world we're living in is not the world of 1946. It's a very different world. <clears throat> and that means that if we're going to cope with it, if we're going to win, <clears throat> we need to begin to change ourselves. And that's not something that's going to be easy. <clears throat> From the principles of containment, 
I think that there are two big lessons that apply to the kind of policies the United States needs to adopt. First, we need to build up our alliances, not neglect them. When, the, when Russian troops invaded Ukraine in 2014, I was among those who argued that the United States and NATO should offer preemptive NATO membership to Ukraine. Moscow should have been put on notice that invading a neighboring country, which, operate, which exists under various agreements that say that Moscow is supposed to respect its borders, will get Moscow in much bigger trouble than it imagines because it will guarantee that it will find itself locked in a conflict with the West as a whole. That wasn't done, but we can still do it again. There are other places where Russia is projecting force that the United States can use its alliance system to educate and resist Russian efforts. We can work with our partners to identify black Russian money the corruption that it's bringing. We can work with our partners <clears throat> to fight with the uh, use, misuse of the internet and social media to undermine democracy. <clears throat> we, can, <clears throat> me, we can work with our partners to make sure that Russia will be identified as the culprit it is in the rise of groups on the far right as well as groups on the far left, something that is not recognized in a large number of countries in the world. Second, the second aspect of, that we can take from the containment principles is that we can use economic force. The United States is still the most powerful country, economic economy in the world. Together with our European allies, we are going to be the most powerful economic bloc for the rest of this century. China is rising. Given its population, it should. One can only hope that it will rise in that sense. But the, the West, that is to say, Europe and the United States, are the dominant economies going. And we can make use of our economic power against countries that don't behave well. Sanctions work. They really work. It's no accident that Russia has not been able to launch any satellites this past year. It simply can't because it can't get the equipment it needs. It can't refit its only aircraft carrier because it can't get the equipment it needs thanks to sanctions. Sanctions are a valuable tool. They're not the only one, but they can matter. And with regard to the economy, the United, the West Europeans have shown the way to make sure that income differentiation doesn't get out of hand. The United States unfortunately has allowed income differentiation to grow more than is safe for a democratic society. We can change that. Uh, politics suggests that we will. And because we need to do that to make our society more defensible against others. We need to isolate the radical anything goes kind of capitalism on offer from Putin in Moscow to make sure that the entire population of every country is taken care of rather than there being a handful of very rich people and a large mass of very poor ones. The second point I would make is that we need to draw from the principles of rollback. It may very well be that the best we can do in countering Vladimir Putin's Russia is to work for its disintegration. There are large parts of the country, some of them non-Russian, but some of them ethnic Russian, like, like most of Siberia, and the Far East that are as oppressed by Moscow as anybody else. I see no reason for not saying that it is the policy of the United States as it has been historically to support the right of peoples to self-determination. And that goes for people in the North Caucasus, the Middle Volga, Siberia, the Urals, and the Far East. It also goes for the Russians who quite frankly are more oppressed than a lot of other people in other countries simply because their government invokes them, but it doesn't provide them with the support that it promises. With regard to that, I think there's no reason that the United States should not radically step up its sanctions regime. Seeing Russia as an existential threat means that sanctions should be extended not only sectorally, but in terms of individuals 
and those individuals should include everyone right up to the dictator in the in the Kremlin. We can do that without difficulty, and I also see no reason why, given Russia's uh, actions against ourselves and against its neighbors and our friends, that we shouldn't suspend Russia immediately from the swift financial settlement system. Yes, some New York bankers would lose money because Russians would pull out some of their deposits. But the fact is, until Russia decides that it's going to live by the rules, rather than live in a world that seeks no rules, as Mr. Putin does, we need to take the kind of steps we can take, short of war, to put Russia back in the box, and radical sanctions will do that. Third, one of the things that I'm most proud of in my career is that I worked uh, for uh, both sides of the aisle, as it were, of US international broadcasting. Both surrogate broadcasters like Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, and the government broadcaster, The Voice of America. We should be doing a lot more than that. We should be broadcasting more. We should be thinking about moving to direct to, to home satellite TV broadcasts now that we're no longer doing very much in the shortwave area. Most people don't realize that when the United States decided to stop using shortwave radio, it effectively handed a censor's uh, uh, pencil to the Russians. If you broadcast only in FM, you need to have your broadcasting center within 30 to 50 miles of the people you want to reach. What does that mean? It means if you want to reach the people in Moscow, you have to broadcast from the suburbs of Moscow. Guess what that does? It gives Moscow itself the ability to set the rules and Moscow is using them increasingly against both the government broadcaster and surrogate broadcaster. That needs to change. Greater reliance on the internet is a good thing, but I, I'm convinced that direct to home satellite television broadcasting is the future. It may, be it may seem expensive, but it's cheap in terms of the geopolitical rewards. And third point I wanna make is that we have to change ourselves. First and foremost, that means we need to stop living in this dream world, that the only threats that are on the horizon to the United States come from Islam in the Middle East or China in the Far East. The biggest threat to the United States and our way of life right now from abroad comes ne from neither of those places. It comes from the Russian Federation and its government which is committed to the destabilization and destruction of American democracy, the undermining of American influence throughout the world, and destabilization of our friends and allies in such a way that the West will cease to exist. That is the kind of challenge we should be responding to rather than remaining in denial. It's important that we, therefore, first and foremost, recognize that we have a problem, because if we realize there's a problem, we're much more likely to do something about it. Second, that means that the, the American people need to recommit themselves to a much more serious program of public education. Civic training, as it used to be called, courses like Problems of Democracy, which I took 50 years ago when I was in high school, those things need to be restored. We have so much to be proud of in this country. That doesn't mean we don't have problems and there doesn't mean that we aren't ashamed. We're free enough and strong enough to be ashamed and to admit our problems. But we need to rebuild the foundations of American identity so that we will be immunized against the kinds of things, the kinds of attacks on truth, the kinds of attacks on civility, the kinds of attacks on democracy that are on offer by Vladimir Putin and his gang. Finally, and more immediately, the United States needs to set put in place a system of media monitoring and response that will allow us to do something to, to counter these Russian activities. Most people are not aware of how much Moscow does and how much it spends to expand its influence. They're simply not aware. That is a national task. It is something that should be pursued 
by a combination of the private sector and the government so that people will be aware that this problem isn't some small thing dreamed up by a coterie of dissident ex-cold warriors or not so ex-cold warriors, but by people who are legitimately and, and deeply concerned about the prospects for American democracy, where many of its leaders are in denial about the threats we face, looking at the wrong threats and ignoring the more fundamental ones. Doing all this is going to be extraordinarily difficult for Americans, especially given that we think that what we did from 1946 to 1991 provides a model for success, forgetting that that model was appropriate against the threat we faced then, but is not appropriate anymore for the threat we, we now face coming from Moscow. But I'm absolutely convinced and therefore I'm especially pleased to have the chance to talk with you today, that with some understanding of the nature of the threat, we can win out and we will. History is on our side. History is on the side of democracy and free market capitalism. And the words free and market are just as important as capitalism in that. Vladimir Putin is a man of the past, not a man of the Soviet past, but a man of the uh, vicious, unrestrained, swashbuckling capitalist class before societies took measures to bring it under some measure, some degree of social control. That may be something some people in this country want to go back to. But it is not something that we as a modern democracy can ever afford. We need to recognize that the existential threat coming from Moscow today is far greater than the existential threat that came from Moscow under the late Soviet Union. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for both the breadth and depth of your analysis. One thing George Kennan said in his famous essay was that the Soviet Union uh, was impervious to the logic of reason, but highly susceptible to the logic of force. Does that statement still apply to Russia as it did to the Soviet Union? Well, I think that the, the Putin regime is also impervious to reason. Uh, what the Soviet Union or what the Putin regime believes, however, is that force only exists if someone's prepared to use it. Uh, the United States has enormous capacities to use force, but it usually chooses not to use them. Uh, we're, of course, reason entirely reasonably and justifiably uh, concerned that any use of direct use of force against the Russians might lead to a nuclear exchange where we would be victimized too. Um, what Kennan was driving at is that force used with some cleverness can constrain what Russia will do. I think that's probably still true and hence that's why I argued for revival of our alliance system and its expansion eastward. I would love to see the day when Georgia and Ukraine and Azerbaijan are part of NATO. I think they should be, they should have been already, but I would like to see that happen. That's to send a, put a marker down that there is a force that Russia had better not cross. The Russian military simply isn't capable of standing up to a NATO country. One of the reasons that the war in the Southern Caucasus ended the way it did is that Russia realized that its weapons weren't as good as the ones Azerbaijan had gotten from Israel and Turkey. And its, its military wasn't as well trained and therefore it did not want to risk getting into a confrontation with Turkey where the weapons are better and the training is better too. So uh, force does work, but you have to use it and so you have to be able, you have to be ready, willing and able to deploy it in ways that don't lead to nuclear war, but that do send a message. Is Russia impervious to getting those messages? I think not, but, it's, but it requires 
cleverness and sophistication that regrettably we don't always display. Paul, oh, whereas it was uh, fairly easy if you were willing to undertake the effort to understand the, the motivations of the Soviet Union by knowing something about Russian history, but most particularly uh, Marxist-Leninist ideology. What you've been describing as Russia's motivation or more exactly Putin's is simply, uh, I mean, aside from greed, uh, grievance that Russia or the Russian state is driven by a sense of grievance. Mm -hmm. So it's animated by revenge. That's right. I spoke about that. It's a revanche state. Um, that's a little harder for people. Uh, there's not um, a communist manifesto to show them in which they can get some idea of. Well, the idea they, can, of they, can read, they can read Mein Kampf. Or Adolf they, Hitler pursued exactly the same strategy of right. revanchism to come to power in Germany. That Germany had been stabbed in the back, according to him, at the end of World War I. It had not lost the war. It, it groups inside had, uh, had undercut German power and that he, Adolf Hitler, was going to restore it and uh, take revenge on all those who had done those terrible things to Germany inside and on Germany's enemies, France, Britain, and more generally. Yeah. Um, revanchism, is, revanchism is tragically a common feature of countries that have lost some major geopolitical competition. That's why we made such a terrible mistake in my mind in the 1990s by looking away and not asking ourselves, how can we provide both assistance and structuring to make the transition? We didn't do that. We were unwilling to make the kind of investment in the transition. We proclaimed victory and we looked away. That was a mistake and we're now living with the result of that. Had, for example, uh, there had been some adjustment into the draconian arrangements of Versailles, I think very few people in the world would have ever heard of Adolf Hitler. If, you know, if reparations had not been imposed to the degree that they were, that was a big mistake. Unfortunately, in 1991, or the years thereafter, there were very few people in the United States and the West more generally who said, what can we do to make sure that ordinary Russians see that the new system benefits them in very concrete ways? We didn't do that. Instead, we proclaimed that Russia was already a democracy, which it wasn't. We didn't provide very much assistance because we were looking for, quote, a peace dividend constantly. And so Russians were hurting. I mean, it's, it's, it doesn't surprise me at all that people would want revenge. The, the important thing to remember, however, is they want revenge for the fact that they lost power. They don't want to go back to exactly what, what existed when there was, when they had more power. Those are two very different things. Yeah, my only point, Paul, is that um... Of course, that sense of grievance existed in, in Weimar Germany. It was shared widely. But what Hitler had was a, a Nazi ideology based on a race theory of history. Perverse as, as it was, it too had uh, its adherence and, and uh, generated a, a kind of fanaticism. There were many Germans who uh, felt the grievance and the loss, but who who were entirely against Hitler's program. That's all I mean. Now, oh, no, that's true. Now, in Russia, however, that the, 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 the seems to be a harder problem. You could read Mein Kampf, and if you took it seriously, know what was going to happen. W what would you read about Russia today that would give you a similar grasp on its motivations? Well, I think I would start with something I mentioned which is uh, Putin's speech in Munich in 2008. Uh, that's probably the Rosetta Stone as far as understanding Vladimir Putin's uh, conception of the world and of Russia's place in it and of his desire 
to inflict damage on others so that Russia will benefit. If you find yourself having lost, there are two possible ways, there are at least two possible strategies you might adopt. One is to work very, very hard to develop your country so that it would be a great success. Uh, there were many people who thought that Russia with all of its economic possibilities, I mean, it's the only country on earth that has all known minerals in commercially, vi commercially exploitable amount. That country ought to be doing very well, it hasn't. If the, you'd had a Russian government in 1992 uh, that said, we have to change ourselves because the Soviet system didn't work, but we can build a country where we have a, a vibrant economy, where people are making good incomes, where they have hope for the future, where their children will live better than they do. That's one way to proceed, okay? When you're up against countries that are already way ahead of you economically and politically. The other way to proceed, and unfortunately, this is what Vladimir Putin has chosen, is to try to bring the other people down. In other words, to weaken. I would argue that there isn't a single Putin doctrine. There isn't a single Putin vision uh, that uh, is attractive to almost anybody. Uh, helps to explain why he does what he does, which is to try to undermine and destroy successful countries. And I think he's had more success at that than he deserves. Well, it, it, there's, you pointed to the need uh, for education and understanding the nature of the threat that Putin presents and how important it is for the United States to rebuild alliances. Let's take, for instance, That's NATO right. today. Uh, as you know, Germany uh, is not shy uh, about saying that it will not meet its minimum commitment uh, to building its military forces in terms of the 2% of its budget that would be required or of its GDP that would be required to do that. Now, at the same time, Angela Merkel is full steam ahead, so to speak, on the Nord Stream 2 pipeline that will make Germany even more dependent on Soviet gas supplies. Do you point to that as just a clever strategy by Putin to exploit uh, weaknesses in that alliance? I, I, he certainly would love to play that to, to weaken the alliance. I would make uh, just three points of many that could be made, but three on that. The first is um, we should remember that NATO wasn't, was an American institution. It was, our, we paid vastly higher percentage than our share throughout its history. And we did so for a reason because we were beneficiaries of building up a defense in depth in Europe rather than uh, having to fight them in New Jersey. Now that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be working to promote that now that the Europeans are doing better economically, that they shouldn't be paying their fair share. But a hard line 2% figure, I don't think is the best way to get there. I think we should be urging an equitable payment of that. But I think that uh, the announcement of the 2% goal as such ignored the history of the alliance and our own interests. Uh, to be honest, the United States benefits more than anyone else from the existence of NATO. And it isn't wrong that we've been paying more of it. It is wrong that we should always be paying more of it given the changing economies. The second point I would make is Vladimir Putin has made a bet, which to be blunt, isn't a very good bet. He's betting that for the next 50 years or 100 years, hydrocarbons are still going to be the driving force of the economic system in the world. My guess is that one thing the pandemic has certainly shown is that the West's reliance on oil and gas is going to be less 10 years from now than it is today. The ability of Putin to play Western Europe against the United States uh, with oil and gas is going to be a whole lot less than Vladimir Putin imagines because oil and gas are going to be much less important. And they're going to be much less important to the Europeans than they are going to be to the Russians or the Americans.
Well, if I, 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 and so, uh, the second point, the third point is this, I am not confident that the Russian gas export program is going to be as successful for as long in terms of its ability to deliver. One of the things that people forget is that almost all of Russian gas and oil too, but gas in the first instance, passes through permafrost zones in the Russian Federation. The permafrost in Russia is melting very, very rapidly. One of the consequences of that is pipelines are cracking because the Russians didn't build them properly. They didn't build them the way the Trans-Alaska pipeline is each, each of the uh, uh, supports for the pipeline have a freezer element in it to keep the ground frozen so it doesn't shift. That's an extraordinarily expensive thing to do, but it's the only thing you can do if you wanna move lots of gas and oil across uh, a melting permafrost area. The Russians haven't done that. I think we're going to see disruptions of Russian gas and oil deliveries to the West that are going to make it a lot less attractive. Do, do I think that Vladimir Putin is trying to play this game? Yes, but I think that if we, if we often make the mistake of ignoring what Putin is doing, we often sometimes make the mistake of assuming he's in better charge of the situation than other factors are going to, are going to be make possible. If I could close with just, we only have two minutes left, but what about disruptions inside Russia? Uh, of course, Navalny is back in jail, uh, but there were some significant demonstrations in cities across the entire breadth and length of Russia. Um, but what about Putin's vulnerabilities domestically in that respect? My own, my own guess is that Mr. Putin is going to find himself less and less in control of the situation. That doesn't mean we're, I expect to see him getting on an airplane and flying to Switzerland or someplace as, you know, an exile or to be killed by a crowd uh, running over the Kremlin wall. I don't think that's likely. I think that he has enough coercive resources still to prevent that from happening. On the other hand, we've seen actions again and again that show how insecure he really is wasn't just the Navalny demonstrations, which brought out 300,000 people in 150 cities and led to 12,000 arrests, the larger, largest mass arrests in Russia since the death of Stalin. It's the fact that there are demonstrations going on in the North Caucasus, in Ingushetia, in Kalmykia, in Tatarstan, in, in Bashkortostan, in the middle Volga, and not unimportantly in, um, uh, Krasnoyarsk in Siberia, where there's the, the dismissal of a, go a popular governor has caused people to be in the streets every day for more than 200 days at this point. So we're not talking about a man who's uh, got absolute support, but something happened last week, which I think should, should, sh should have been on page one of American newspapers, because it'll tell you just how frightened Putin is of losing the support of the police. Last week, the Kremlin proposed that children of policemen be advanced to the head of the line for admission to Russian universities. If you want to keep the police on your side and they are your last line of defense and you really can't pay them more money because you don't have more money to pay them, giving them a benefit like that tells you that you felt you had to. And when you feel you have to make a, a payment like that, you're, you're announcing to the world that you're not nearly as strong as your supporters in Russia and the West would have us believe. Paul, thank you very much. Um, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us uh, for another in our series of lectures at the Westminster Institute. Please go to our website and you will see other lectures on a variety of subjects that we have provide uh, that are accessible there. Thank you for joining us. See you soon again.